All right, everyone, welcome to another Precisionary webinar. Um, today, our speaker is Dr. Maurizio Ciocchioli, who is an assistant professor of medicine and pulmonary at Yale University School of Medicine. Thank you for joining us. We're honored to have you. Today, he's going to talk to us about spatial temporal coordination of stem cell behavior following alveolar injury. So we're going to take a look at the lung. And quickly, Maurizio um, received his PhD in molecular biology, working at the Institute for Molecular Sciences, University of Queensland. Um, there, he led a large-scale high-throughput analysis to develop the next-generation microalgae system for commercial biofuels applications. And this work in a different system outside of the lung really ignited his passion for quantitative imaging of dynamic systems. So he pursued a short postdoc at the University of Cambridge um, in the Department of Applied Mathematics and Theoretical Physics. And while there, he actually invented a novel live video microscopy platform and worked closely with mathematicians and physicists to study dynamic flagella beating and trajectory of single cell um, bacteria. And now he turned his attention to the biomedical field. And also at the University of Cambridge, he applied these same modeling principles to capture dynamic ciliary beating um, using high speed video microscopy. Um, and then he, this high speed cilia be, uh, ciliary beating um, plays a, a high relevance in the lung. And so he turned to um, assessing drug efficacy in cystic fibrosis patients um, and characterized uh, and potentially diagnosed different variants of primary ciliary dyskinesia. He was then recruited to Yale School of Medicine in 2018, where he is now an assistant professor um, in the section for uh, pulmonary critical care and sleep medicine. And as you, uh, you can all imagine, this is particularly relevant given um, the COVID pandemic in the last couple of years. Um, so with that, um, Maurizio, I want to hand it over to you. And we are very <laughs> excited to hear about what you had to tell us today. Hi. Oh, thank you very much. Can you hear me properly? Can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. All right, thanks. So thank you uh, for the kind introduction and uh, for the opportunity to present today. Uh, so my work is focused on uh, understanding the mechanisms that drive lung remodeling and repair. And today I'm going to tell you about my recent work to understand uh, how this is playing out in the alveolar region of the lung. Um, so as many of you uh, know, uh, lung disease uh, <clears throat> Is a huge burden. Is a huge problem. So there is there are many uh, different types of lung disease, and uh, we in the lab focus mostly on uh, IPF, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, uh, which affects the whole lung tissue. We also know that there is a link, the very important link, within uh, with aging and inflammation, but this uh, we still don't uh, know um, the mechanism behind. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> so, IPF is a fatal, fatal um, without transplant. So, it's age related. And uh, one of the uh, hallmarks of IPF is the excessive fibroblast proliferation and consequent matrix deposition that eventually lead to a formation of this characteristic honeycomb. Uh, structure in the alveolar region and stiffness of the lung and loss of function. So we really we still don't understand what causes IPF and and one and also one of the um, problems is that we are very we have very limited uh, models to understand this. At the moment, we have uh, just two drugs are approved to be used, but neither are cures. <clears throat> so let's zoom a bit more in details in the alveolar region. So the alveoli are the housed in the distal compartment of the lung, and uh, their thin epithelial layer is responsible for gas exchange. Um, type one cell cover about ninety. So the thin layer is, co is mostly con uh, composed by um, um, alveolar type one cells, they covers about 95% of the alveolar surface. And the main function of them is to facilitate gas exchange with, with, the, uh, with the vessels, the blood vessels. 
So whereas the type two, alveolar type two cells, they are covered the remaining about 5%. And the main function is to maintain the integrity and, uh, and the function again the, of the alveolus, mostly by secreting protein like surfactant protein, uh, surfactant protein sorry. Right, so normally uh, upon injury, the, the alveolar type two cells proliferate and replace themselves, but also differentiate to replace loss of type one cells. There is, a, there is also an inflammatory response that leads to the proliferation of fibroblasts and myofibroblasts, which is eventually resolved through apoptosis. Um, so in, in contrast, when uh, in severe or chronic lung injury, the normal repair process is kind of derailed or hijacked. In this situation, so we have uh, type two cells that don't repair properly, and there is a, a persistent inflammation with and um, and that the cellular matrix and myofibroblast accumulation doesn't resolve properly. Eventually, this leads to impaired gas exchange and reduced lung capacity. So the function of alveolar type two cells in, in, is regulated by different cell types and uh, and also signaling pathways in the alveolar region. For example, the fibroblast uh, in the niche. Uh, the loss of type one cells or macrophages or other immune cells and um, such as interstitial, interstitial macrophages. So these are uh, just few of, uh, path of, of the pathways that can be um, regulate the alveolus type two, uh, type two cells and function in response to injury. So if we look at this, uh, this in a more simple version, we know that type two cells give, give rise to themselves and to new type one cells in injury. But we also know that cells from now recent studies show how cells from distal airways can function as a progenitor and replacing uh, type two and type one cells. Um, so and this has been the, the 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 status of the in the field. Like uh, this is our knowledge so far. But recent study uh, revealed that the, there is a previously uncharacterized cell state uh, it, that is generated uh, appear transiently during the differentiation from the type two cells to type one. So these cells, transient cell, refer here as a intermediate progenitor cells are generated following injury and can be identified by different markers. Different studies have identified them using different markers, such as keratinate, cloudin 4 and the GO1, and others. And um, so they go under different names as well, as a, a PATS or keratinate plus ADI or DATP. So we were interested mostly on uh, what happens to when the type 2 cell uh, are activated during injury and and the, to undergo remodeling and repair. So remodeling and repair is a highly dynamic process. Um, and the problem is that uh, our knowledge and insights are mostly derived from static analysis, meaning that, so we, we kill the mouse and maybe we do single cell RNA-seq or immune staining. And all this is great, and it gives our, but it gives our only a snapshot in, snapshot in time. So basically, we are unable to track for the same cell through the space and time in situ to understand what's truly going on and um, and what is what is what are the cell doing. So um, and how they most also how do they interact with other cells or respond to in real time to the perturbation or in in the signaling pathways, for example. So it's it's a very hard task uh, to ask this question if we really cannot follow this the same cell over time, right? So uh, live tracking of stem cell behavior is, has been a powerful system for discovering other tissue. Like you can see here, example of um, uh, combining imaging with genetic model that in the in the in the hair follicle or muscle stem cell or hematopoietic stem cell, and uh, so this. Uh, Coupling this with genetic mouse model to detect cells and to perturbate molecular pathways and process has allowed many, fun many fundamental mechanisms of stem cell behavior to be uncovered. Um, there is now an increasing evidence that stem cells, for example, rather than being static and linear in their proliferative uh, and self renewal capabilities, are instead highly dynamic. So they interact with distinct niche and uh, and also with the environment like extracellular environment. 
So we were inspired by this approach. We wanted to see if we could do something similar in the lung. So especially in the in the stem cell repair uh, mechanism, which has actually never been done before. So we take a we can, we take two approach. One uh, we use the lung tissue slice culture, which is PCLS, which I will explain in, a, in the next slides, as well as the gold standard, which is in vivo imaging of a live in a live mouse using a permanent lung window. So this allows us to revisit the same cell over time and region of, and that of tissue and through the course of the injury. And so <clears throat> lung slice culture or PCLS that we call in the lung, um, Mm, it's a great system because it's, uh, first of all, preserved the lung tissue structure and cell-to-cell -cell interaction. Uh, it's basically a section of live uh, lung tissue culture ex vivo. We can culture and maintain them, these lice, for about from five to seven days in culture, say. And we've done a lot of quality control in the lab of the sections and to see that the tissue integrity is actually maintained over this time. One of the advantage of using PCLS comparing to in vivo or, uh, is that we can really get a lot of uh, a lots of replicates. Right? So we, from a single lung, you can get like up twenty four to thirty slices, and that's and that's much more efficient. So for those that are not familiar with the um, precision lung slices, lung slice PCLS. So this is a uh, the vibraton that we've been using in the lab from Precisionary, and this is an example of. Um, uh, with lice here, where we see uh, a mouse lung embedded in the in the um, agarose, and then the vibraton slice, and, and you can see slices coming out nicely from the from the section. And then in the next slides, you see how you know just uh, the protocol that we use to maintain them. Uh, you can see actually here in this in these slides an example of human slices and uh, lung slices and uh, mouse lung slices so that we can both do in the lab now. So we optimize both protocols. We can also cryopreserve them and that we can ship them overnight and they stay alive. And uh, and also you can see here an example of uh, a mouse PCLS after 100, about 130 hours called ex vivo cultivated. And you can see how the green is basically live cells after the staining with the live cell staining. And the red is the death cell, so it's basically well preserved and still alive. Now, so we took advantage of the PCLS to to try to see if we could observe the cell, the live cells in the alveolar region. So this is a schematic of our settings, and um, you can see how we use um, a, a, a multi wire plate system, and they were published before. But we can, we had, with few addition here we um, we. The insert we use as as like channels that can facilitate the distribution, the flow of the media, and we use as a spacer that that keeps this insert on top of the slice here, and that doesn't squish it down. And uh, and this is keep this the slice basically on the bottom of the on the top of the glass stable over the period of time that we can image them, and we were able to. I mean, we kept of course the the slice. And in the ideal condition of um, you know, five percent CO two, thirty seven degrees, and ninety percent humidity. Um, now, and also, so we we took we use a GFP report in mice to tag type two cells, and uh, TD tomato to tag all the other cell membrane in the mouse. So we injured the mice with bleomycin, a typical uh, classic um, uh, model for reproducing fibrosis in in the mouse model. Uh, at day zero, and uh, we harvest the lung at the uh, three days post injury to generate PCLS, and then we culture them and we image them for uh, further three three days. So these are present the very early stage of injury because we were really interested to understand what happens uh, to the time to the type two cell when they are activated upon injury. So, and what we saw, um, what's very surprising to me, and and that a lot is that so we see here an example of uh, type two cell becoming multi response to a viral injury. So the type two cells in this video are the GFP label cells. So you can see how, um, in this example, you can see how this they show this very interesting uh, multi phenotype behavior, and that was very 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 fascinating to us. And so we we. 
we repeat the experiments over and over, and uh, we were able to repeat to to see again this uh, this behavior. Uh, like in this example, you can see a type two cell crossing uh, over uh, what looks like an alveolar and changing shape and remodeling themselves to probably repair the injury. Um, so we we record lots of these videos and then we analyze them. And this is an example of just flow of uh, image processing and analysis. And we were able, first of all, to quantify a displacement length. In the, and we can see here how uh, the cell treated with bleomycin, I mean, the, the sample, the cell in the sample treated with bleomycin show a very, very um, strong uh, displacement length compared to control. We also notice how if we re if the, we record the cells and we wait until 10 days longer, we, the cells stop moving. And when we look at an example here of what, of this uh, situation, uh, basically 10 days post bleomycin, you can see how there is higher already extracellular matters deposition in this region. You can see how the type two cells become already spread and uh, they, they don't move. This is a video and you can see how cell, there is no movement at all. And it's probably, a, I mean, we don't know exactly what's happening, but we think uh, the, the cell have any, the extracellular matrix changes affects the movement. Now, we also notice a, a, a range of dynamic and heterogeneous behavior in these cells. So meaning that there is no a clear directionality of the cell movement, either neither in 2D or in 3D trajectories. And uh, so what we were really fascinated by the fact that this cell moves and become motile upon injury, um, because we thought it may be representing an, a new cellular mechanism of repair. So if, if, a stel if a stem cell can expand its spatial domain and migrate to where uh, they are needed, that would be really cool. So in fact, this does happen in other systems, but it has never been really observed in the lung. In fact, one of the uh, long outstanding question in the field is whether type two cell can repair not only their own alveolus, but they also migrate to repair adjacent, adjacent alveoli. And, and the, this is actually, we, know, we observe that, and as you can see in, in this example, actually motility, we show how motility is not confined to the same alveolus. So here is an example of uh, uh, type two cell migrating from uh, one side of uh, an alveolus to an, uh, crossing to another side. Um, and uh, we, when we look in details to, the, um, to this particular video, you can not, you, we notice how the cells in specific goes through a, such an aperture here. And this is what we think is a is so-called porocons. They've been um, um, speculated for. I mean, there are these are structure in the in the, the, in the alveolar region that facilitate uh, not just uh, uh, the maintain of the pressure between uh, compartments, but also uh, the cells use this uh, this aperture to go through pores like macrophages. And now uh, we also so we also notice how this. Um, uh, type two cell can cross uh, alveolar boundaries, so they can go to very changing shape dramatically and go across. And another great observ uh, interesting observation is that they, be they change the shape of the, uh, and they also become elongated, but also they go through a septums between uh, between alveolus. And so these are all very fascinating uh, behavior, right? So the next question we ask was that. Uh, are there rules that gov govern this type two cell response? Or, and what do I mean by rules? I mean like um, uh, the the quantity parameters that could uh, predict their behavior through space and time. So to address this question, we I collaborate with the Dr. Smita Krishna Swami, a computer scientist here at Yale, and uh, our students Samner Magruder. And what we found actually is that the type two cell response is not actually uniform. Um, so what the Krishna Swami lab did was to develop a new and um, supervised algorithm. Uh, we call this uh, LCE fate, and this takes all the, all the morphokinetic in, um, parameters from the from every movie across hundreds of moving cells. And as you see here in the in this heat map is just to show you that the number of features and the two conditions, so BLEO and uh, control, and why we can see a difference between the two conditions is actually, it's almost impossible to extract any rules 
or make any hypothesis based on this data. So what the uh, this uh, LCFA, LCFA does is to cluster cells that have the most similar parameters through time and space, and uh, and they represent these uh, relations as a um, trajectory. So here we see all the trajectory possibly all color code for different parameters, displacement area, and uh, so on. So if we look at displacement um, for in particular, so you can see that there is an heterogeneity and multiple clusters, okay, showing high displacement in red and also in the middle. But then when you look at the same clusters, but now coded for area, so you see that while some of the high displacements have high area, but others don't. Um, so we went back to the, to validate this computational findings, and we saw that whether this is sort of, um, to see if this is true. Um, and actually, type two cell response in a the response is actually a heterogeneous manner in terms of morphology. And in this example, you see um, um, a cell that uh, moves, but also uh, shape the shape of this body elongate a lot. While in another example here, you see uh, a high, high displacement, but with a large and cup shape at the end. Um, we see also this even in the same video, and that is just to say that, and this is also to show you how the, we also quantify these parameters. Now, many videos later, um, what we conclude is that type two cell respond via at least uh, three behavioral distinct paths. Uh, we have a cuboidal, uh, which is uh, no movement at all. Uh, we have an elongating uh, behavior and uh, a large, as I showed before, large cut behavior. So we think this is important because um, it could re reflect a different properties of the cell, uh, which may be linked to their fate and uh, the environment they are um, navigating. So the big question is, does, it, does any of these matter? Um, so we remind here that just to remind you here of this uh, repair pathway uh, type two cells, uh, intermediate progenitor cells, type one and type two. And but what happened if we, you know, if we block this mortality, for example, that was the first question we asked. And um, so this is, does this pathway get affected by this? So um, we repeat the same experiments with the same setting. This time we, we, we had uh, rock inhibitor on the PCLS ex vivo, and we ask if this motility affects differentiation of type 2 cell GFP into keratinate positive in particular as a marker for intermediate progenitor cells. So we first check uh, that uh, when uh, when we had the rock inhibitor, we actually we block um, the motility. As you can see in this spider plus here, uh, after the rock inhibitor, the displacement is actually reduced almost to the level of control. So we can block, so we know now that we can block motility, which is great, but does there any, does this affect um, the, the, how this affect the type two cell stem cell uh, commitment to differentiation? Um, so we stain to address this question. We stain for one of the marker that has been used to to, to characterize the intermediate progenitor cells, and and uh, the transient cell type between type two and type one. So we found that in the number of keratinate positive cells is greatly reduced when we block motility, as you can see here. Um, and uh, but also, uh, so sorry, and so this was. Um, the main finding from the from the immunofluorescence. So, so to summarize here, so what we think is happening is that the type two cell become more tired upon injury, and then uh, when we block this motility with with um, like in this case with rock inhibitor, we also block the commitment to to the intermediate progenitor cells. So we think so this might be having uh, important implications for in the repair pathways. Um, and now we we follow we are following this up with additional markers and the experiments for intermediate progenitor cells. Now, we, the next question we ask is was uh, what happens uh, in vivo, right? So we were very interested to see if we can uh, follow the, the behavior of type two cells post injury in uh, in vivo settings. So we collaborate with David Enterberg at Einstein College of Medicine. David developed an amazing 
system that we can see here is basically a surgery that implants a permanent lung window in the in the chest of the mouse. And here, this here, this animal is perfectly fine after the surgery. It can be, um, you know, it has its normal life in the cage after the surgery. And what is amazing about this system is that uh, basically allows you, sorry. Uh, so um, to, fo to follow the same cells in the in vivo settings this time. So it is just a schematic of the experiments that we repeat. So we repeat the same settings with the same mouse reporter and um, the same day. So, but um, this is amazing because you can actually image um, the same region, the same cell. And as you can see here at the microscope, the multi-photon microscope over time for three days uh, using the same mice. So after the imaging, you can put the mice back to the cage and then you the second day you can repeat the same finally the same cell and following their fate and what we found is that uh, it was very very similar to what we saw in the in the pcls uh, so become basically the type 2 cell become multi post pleo which is consistent with what we saw before in the ex vivo system in this in, especially in terms of at least uh, displacement length you can see how there is a big difference um and um, they can, we can, see, we saw that for the first time in vivo uh, in the living breeding mice, uh, lung, uh, that this type two cell can also cross. Uh, seems like they can cross boundary as we show in the ex vivo system. And also, we confirms the heterogeneous behavior that uh, characterize these cells post injury. Like in this example here, you can see how the cell, some of the cell can be, become very large and some others they become very elongated. Right, so to summarize this part, so we are really excited about these findings because we believe uh, that uh, motility of type two cells is, may rep represent an important new mechanism underlying uh, this the effective repair. So what's interesting is also is that uh, since this motility seems to be lost around day 10 or so, and which we think may be because of the accumulation of changes in the cellular matrix uh, composition and properties. Um, so we hypothesize that this could also be happening in uh, chronic lung disease, such as IPF. And the loss of motility there could also be related to the failure of repair, um, to the proper repair. Now, one of the things I haven't told you about intermediate progenitors of cells is that there is an increasing evidence that's to suggest they may be involved in chronic lung disease as a, in a kind of aberrant persistent form. <clears throat> so these data are um, mostly based on uh, the uh, single cell RNA sequencing, showing that these cells express lots of genes associated with chronic lung disease like environmental stress, inflammation, just gene programs, source of prophybrotic factors, DNA damage, and so on, and senescence. So how is this? So the question we're asking now is, how is this important to understand human lung disease? Right? So in a recent work in a from our lab, so we um, they develop a, a very amazing tools that is a so-called the IPF cell atlas. Uh, showing here in, the, in this UMAP in 3D. Um, and in, more interestingly about one of the main, one of the interesting findings, uh, very important findings from this work, sorry, is that we, they identify a uh, previously um, described epithelial cell population that shows up here in this circle uh, in IPF, uh, in IPF con uh, lung sample, uh, sorry, uh, data from uh, IPF con patients. Um, and this, so, the so-called uh, aberrant, aberrant basaloid cells, uh, uh, this epithelial group of epithelial cells, they sit at the edge of uh, the myofibroblast fossae here. And interestingly, they are very similar seen as with gene signature to the one that we saw in, the, in our uh, intermediate progenitor cells in the, in the mouse model. So, <clears throat> so we think that Intermediate progenitor cells could be a really important model uh, to understand the origin of chronic lung disease. And now we want to understand more about the mechanisms that drive their transition uh, during repair, but also 
and most importantly, in, during disease. <clears throat> now, uh, so what we're planning to do next is we want to define the in vivo uh, be cellular behavior that drive the transition of these intermediate progenitor cells in two settings, in acute and in chronic injury models. And what we want to do also to, is to define um, uh, the gene expression and the chromatin accessibility during this transition. Well, <clears throat> so the first question we want to address is um, um, when do these inter intermediate progenitor cells um, arise in lung injury? And we want to compare uh, this in two different uh, injury models, bleo and virus. And we will use, to do this, we will employ a, um, 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 a report in my slide that is more, seems like to be very specific, more specific for, to track the appearance of the intermediate progenitor cells, which is the Andirgia one cree mouse model that has been shown that is, looks like quite good to identify this uh, this um, appearance of the intermediate progenitor cell. Um, now, at the beginning of the talk, I told you that um, the intermediate progenitor cells can arise from two sources. So alveolar stem cells, like the type of cells, the resident, but also distal airways stem cell progenitor cells. So for us, this is really fascinating that the same cell can come from two different parent populations. So, and the question we want to ask is whether, uh, so what is the relative contribution of these two potential source uh, of, <clears throat> to the intermediate progenitor cells? And uh, it, it also if there is a difference in their behavior. So we will use, um, to try to answer this question, we will use two different mouse lines and to, to, try, to try to track this, uh, the, the, the origin and contribution of this. Um, and uh, so we we can use these two models to see if what they can come either from the type two cells or the distal airway. So by its two markers, so both both strains can also carry this uh, the intermediate progenitor style report in mice. Uh, and finally, we will try to look at the whether the cell of the cell of origin has any effect on uh, effect on the fate of the intermediate progenitor cells and their capacity to repair. So we don't want to speculate, but, but um, one potential hypothesis could be that is the intermediate progenitor cells originated from outside the levels go to become aberrant. Uh, we have no idea if that's true, of course, but it's something that we are excited to find out. And, uh, and um, of course, we want to understand what's going on at the genetic level and what drives this transition. So to do to answer this question, we need to dive much deeper at the transcriptomic and the epigenetic level and to uncover key possible, hopefully, key gene uh, regulatory pathways um, and mechanisms. So we are still asking this some, same question about uh, intermediate progenitor cells heterogeneity and how this is linked to fate and function. Um, but this time we're taking a molecular approach to address this. So to do so, to do this, to try to address this question. So we're taking a multi-omics approach, combining single cell and RNA seq to look at gene expression, as well as uh, ATAC seq to look at chromatin accessibility within the same cell. And we're doing this uh, kind of in a time uh, over time uh, in a time uh, time course experiments in two different injury model, and both um, and we're looking at both gene expression and chromatin accessibility simultaneously. And we hope to uncover not only what genes could be important, but also uh, uh, associate what are the, uh, the one associated with the intermediate progenitor cell transition during this injury model. And by also with the epigenetic, regu the epigenetic regulatory factor that can drive them at the, uh, let's say, the chromatin level. We are also in the process of developing a, a very, very powerful tool, which, um, which is a single cell ablation uh, with this within the stem cell niche, following by live imaging with a in permanent lung window. So this way we can. Uh, functionally uh, dissect the cell-to-cell the -cell interaction that drive chronic uh, lung disease. So the overall goal here is to try to uncover the genes and signaling pathways that can regulate and drive successfully or not the, um, 
this um, the repair during the in chronic disease conditions. Um, so through changes in cell-cell interaction in the niche, uh, changes in gene expression programs and signaling and so on. So uh, from, from these uh, studies, we hope to identify new potential new targets that can be translated into therapeutic intervention or to promote success, uh, either to promote successful repair or block disease progression. Okay, so now I'm gonna uh, switch gear a bit, like try to uh, show you um, how we can have, how we can use uh, also PCLS as a translational platform to towards potential therapeutics. Um, <clears throat> In particular, so I'm gonna so I'll show you here how we can use a human a sample from human lung to to generate precision cut lung slices in the lab. Here you can see an example of a section from a, a explant from a from a lung uh, sec, um, from a from a human lung, and here you can see an example of PCLS generated with a vibrotome as a in and culture in ex vivo. So. We are now able to um, keep this, uh, this keep this uh, slice, sorry, in uh, ex vivo in culture for up to 130 hours. Um, so this sample mostly come from transplant, lung transplant. The, as I say, we can, uh, we are now able to cry preserve them and to re to reuse them later if we need to. So that's a very, uh, that's very good. We can create a kind of uh, biobank. And also we are able to receive samples from clinics all around the country and to use them live in the, in the lab, successful in the lab. <clears throat> now, the question we asked uh, on, on PCLS is that can we use this PCLS to model lung disease? And the answer is, uh, I think is yes. <laughs> so a recent study uh, show how we can use, they developed this uh, so-called fibrotic cocktail. Uh, the fibrotic cocktail is a mix of different prophybrotic factors like the um, TGF beta, TNF alpha, LPA, and, and others. Um, and here you can see when uh, you you apply the fibrotic cocktail on the PCLS, a normal PCLS from human PCLS, and uh, you can follow this PCLS after under 20 hours, you can see how the phenotype changes and becoming um, fibrosis like. Um, so we um, we used we use uh, human PCLS recently to test the efficacy of the of a lead therapeutic uh, microRNA. <clears throat> this was in collaboration with an industry company, Mirogen. So we obtained health, healthy human lung samples. Um, we generate PCLS and then we induce the fibrosis with the fibrotic cocktail, and then uh, we treat them with a mir twenty nine mimic, and we saw how fibrosis uh, was reduced. And we also look at special of key uh, fibrosis associated genes, such as collagen one and three, and they show how to go down in upon treatment. And um, and also as well as uh, the overall content of collagen as shown here in this plot. Um, we also, um, sorry, another example, this is another example of how we apply this, the, the we use the PCLS, human PCLS in, an, in another study from our lab. Um, to screen potential therapeutics. In this case, it's an inhibitor, uh, is a saracatinib that blocks the fibrotic response <clears throat> in preclinical model of fibrosis. Um, so to, to facilitate this, we are now developing a, a chamber that enable us to manipulate the control of the human PCLS conditions in each well, I can see here. Each well contains one PCLS and then um, we can uh, separately in, uh, change the conditions why we are serving the cells at the microscope. So this is very cool because we will enable us, enable us to see exactly how the cell respond in real time when we treat them with drugs or we change the conditions. So I finish here and I hope um, I have convinced you that um, so the type two cells are, are, are motile following injury, and they can also cross alveolar compartments. Uh, so not hold the past list to wrong, meaning that different behavior linked to different outcomes, maybe. Um, so cells do surprising important things. So in vivo and ex vivo imaging can really tell us more about the behavior and can help to uncover new rules of tissue regeneration or repair. 
So we combining the genetic mouse models and single laser ablation will allow, probably, hopefully, will allow us to functionally perturbate and uh, and help to uh, to test our hypothesis. And also large scale multiomics, hopefully, we identify key gene regulatory networks that and signaling pathways that can drive cell retransition and behavior. And hopefully, identify new molecular target and cellular targets for lung disease in human PCS. So with this, I would like to, to thanks all the wonderful colleagues and collaborators that I work with, I have, I'm lucky to work with, and particularly Martali Kaminsky, Maur Sallers, Mita Krishnaswamy, David Antaber, Sumner, John, Caroline, Valentina, Jessica, David, and all the people that are part of their group. Um, and thank you all for listening, and I'm very happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Maurizio. We have a question here, and actually, um, um, it's from Anne Lynch. So, if you want to unmute yourself and ask it or show your video, we'd be happy to have a small group talk. Yes. Okay. Stop sharing that. Let's see. Would you be able to unmute? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, great. Go ahead. <laughs> Um, yeah, I just had a question about the uh, AT2 cells during normal motility after the bleomycin. Do you ever see that they ever lose any of their typical AT2 cell markers like surfactant protein C during this process? Thank you. That's a that's a very interesting question. Unfortunately, we haven't um, we haven't really tested a single. I mean, we didn't do any uh, genetic analysis like single cell or. You know, on this particular during this particular experiment or project, so we were mostly focused on the on the phenotype, and that's something will definitely be interesting to do. Um, and we are planning actually to do more experiments, as I say, and one of those uh, will be a uh, single cell or any sick on time on on these uh, cells. Thank you. You're welcome. And we have another question by um, Joe Ferguson. So please go ahead and unmute if you'd like to ask. Hi, um, thanks so much for such an interesting talk. Um, yeah, I had a couple of questions, one more technical. Um, yeah. When you are maintaining the slices for the five to seven days, is that just in static culture or is that with perfusion? With diffusion, meaning, sorry? Perfusion, is that with like oxygen? Ah, perfusion, no, um, so there are two things. One is the normal conditions when you maintain the cells, the PCLS in the normal incubator, and you don't image them. So in that case, we can maintain them for five, seven days as most of, I mean, these are standard protocols now. I think most of the people that probably use PCLS, they can do the same. And then there is the other aspects that when we image the cell, so when we imaging for live imaging with the PCLS, we keep them, uh, three days at the microscope. That's the maximum we can do. Uh, otherwise, we go bankrupt uh, to pay the the, the confocal. <laughs> so, uh, so we keep the three days there. And during these three days, we fit, we change the media once. Before we were doing them manually, which are uh, carefully not disturbing the cells. Now with the perfusion chamber, we we hopefully can keep it longer and without you know, changing conditions and more smoothly. No, but we didn't go to seven days at the microscope or imaging. No, we hope to do that next. Yes. Yeah, with the chambers. Great. Thanks. And my other question was just, do you have any idea if the motility of AT2, AT2 cells may change with age? That's another very great question. Uh, that's a beautiful question I would like to answer. Um, we were thinking to do that next again, um, because uh, it would be very interesting to see if there is a different response of type 2 cells with aging, definitely, yeah. yeah. But I don't know that answer, I mean. I'm, I'm, I'll look yeah. forward to hearing the answer when yeah. you have it. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Thank you. Maurizio, you have to come back to us and share us the answer <laughs> when you find out. All right, a next machine then. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there, are there any more questions or comments from, um, yes, Dr. Zhao? Yes, I um. thank you for the talk. Um, I'm Rogan mm -hmm. Zhao, I'm an associate professor at, at University of Buffalo. Um, yeah. I'm also working in the lung fibrosis field. Um, so your talk is very interesting. So we just started to uh, adopting, um, we're actually bought the same device from, from the company doing the lung slice. Um, yeah. So I just have a, um, um, a question, you know, 
the uh, intermediate um, progenitor cells are very interesting. And yeah. then on the slide that you show, you're observing these cells in the periphery of this myofibroblast foci. Okay. So the human, yeah. What, what do you think is the rationale or, or the reason for these IPC cells in the periphery, right? Because I mean, the reason I ask is that my lab has a, a great interest in um, sort of understanding the spatial relationship in the myofibrillar foci, right? Because the, the reason is that lung fibrosis is a highly heterogeneous de uh, disease and then also progressive. Right? And yeah. then the hypothesis that the myofibrillar foci is the source of the disease progression. You know, these uh, disease right. cells, they, um, they progress to the healthy regions. And then the fact that you see these uh, intermediate um, progenitor cells in the periphery, do you think that maybe they are serving as a sort of invasive frontiers um, in this uh, progression process? What do you think? Oh, thanks for the question. So first of all, I need to make a distinction. So the, the human sample that the, the human uh, in the human sem, uh, IPF what I show you is the previous work that's been published in the from the lab uh, where they found the aberrant basilar cells in the uh, uh, fibroblast foci okay and what I show you from the mouse model is a bit different so is similar the IPC intermediate progenitor cells they are those are the one from the mouse model we don't know uh, I mean, in the mouse, we don't really see fibroblast foci, right? So the mouse model in bleomycin doesn't right, show yeah. up the same exactly. Not, yeah, it's right. not that I have that. Yeah. What we know uh, when the, is that these two population cells, the basaloid and intermediate progenitor cell, there seems to have quite a lot of similarity in terms of uh, mm -hmm. uh, gene signature, right? right? We don't know yet if this is something that we can use or not for to understand the role of basaloid cells. We hope so. But it's still early stage, so we don't. Uh, we these are the next steps that we're taking out to understand this more um, in more details, right? Um, so we actually also from the basilar perspective in the human, this uh, these are the key questions that Naftali and the group is trying to answer now: it's the origin of the cells and the function and the role in the IPF. Yeah, we, yeah. is this the question that we don't know yet? Okay. But these are, you know, but these are the formation of these uh, malfibrillar foci. Um, I, I think in the past people hypothesized that's because the disrupt, um, disruption of the alveolar structure, right? Because the the malfibrillar their contractile, they uh, generating contraction force, and that's uh, disrupting the alveolar structure. So, but mm. then as the structure being destroyed, but then your epithelial cells they didn't die, right? So they're still in there, but as they contract, so there may be still remain on the outer periphery of this yeah. destructive structure. Do you think that that might be the- I don't know, I can't, I, 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 I'm not sure if, I don't know if I can answer the question. It's very, I mean, those, the, the, the formations we have for the basaloid is really that at the moment they're sitting on the fibroblast foci from the human, in the human IPF samples. We don't know. We don't have information about the dynamics, because, they, uh, okay. so we don't know. Yeah. yeah, but you know that's I I think you, know, but that, you know the the fact that I seeing your result is, is very interesting. It's very exciting. Um, I I think that's a yeah. That's you know that's a direction we're interested in. Um, uh, also, you know the um, a, a more technical question. Uh, we yeah. have been working with this uh, precision cut long slides uh, for a while. Um, is there, but we, you know, our viability is, is actually very low. Um, is there any uh, a suggestion that you can give us, you know, in terms of the technical issues, how to use um, viability? What, what do you mean by low? Um, you know, we're just after cutting, you know, um, the next day or on day three, when we're checking using this uh, live and death staining, most of them are dead. Um, huh. I mean, we have tried multiple Rounds, you know, I, I know, you know, this has been repeated by many labs, which can, you know, many labs can maintain your viability. Yeah. Um, it just didn't work in, in my lab. We're using the same equipment following the published protocol. Um, it just didn't work. I, I'm just I don't know. Uh, not sure. I mean, 
we are following the protocol. Uh, we didn't do anything sp particular to, to So we're very, I mean, not sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, but so, the agros yeah. that you're using, um, when you're infusing the agros into the into the lung, you're, what's the temperature that you, you maintain your agros at? Well, uh, we, the agros needs to be, to be, to be maintained as fluid. Yeah. Has to be warm at 40, 40 degrees at least. 40 degrees. Otherwise, otherwise it's solidified, right? Yeah, but I think we are maybe uh, too hot. So that may be uh, <laughs> That's the hot problem. agros may be killing myself. Okay, okay. Right. Okay, thank you very much. You know, I'm You're looking welcome. forward. Yeah, you know, future, you know, uh, talking to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zhao, for your questions. Um, if there's not anybody else, um, and then I'm going to go ahead and um, adjourn our webinar. And again, thank you, Maurizio, for your time. Thanks for giving me the opportunity. It was a pleasure. Wonderful. Everybody, have a good week. Thank you. Bye.